Good evening, everybody. Today is Tuesday, September 27th, 2022. Today is a caseless defense webinar. We'll be going to 10 o'clock. It's an hour and a half in the month of September. Um, with a show of hands, can you tell me if you can hear me well? Do you have good audio? Okay, very good. Thank you so much. You could lower those hands. Um, does anybody have any questions before we start about anything? Just going down the line here. I don't see anybody with any questions. Does anybody want to participate in the hot seat? Tiffany, I'm going in your direction. Are you I there, can Tiffany? hear me. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Excellent. How you doing? I'm doing well. I'm uh, getting a little nervous about test date, but uh, here we are. It's in October. Tugging it's along. in October. Yep. Three weeks. Gotcha. Three weeks. Gotcha. Um, do you want to go with a specific case or do you want a topic? What are you looking for? Um, I think either office or OB. Uh, you're looking for a specific case or just a topic? No. Um, just uh, any any case, I think that kind of catches your eye. I'd love to talk about. OK, hold on. Let me go get your case list. You don't see my screen anymore, correct? No, I don't. OK, perfect. Let me look for your list here. <clears throat> Office or GYN, you said? Uh, Office or OB, yes. OB, sorry. No particular case that's concerning you? Um, no, <laughs> not yet. Okay. Okay. Right. Just making sure. I'm just looking for a case. Bear with me a second. Okay. Case number five, you see it there? I do, yes. So can you tell me when you have the different types of perineal lacerations that can occur? So um, there are four different uh, degrees of perineal lacerations um, from, from degree one to third, first degree, sorry, to fourth degree. Um, the first degree type of laceration is the most superficial, and this would involve um, a break in the vaginal mucosa, but not extending to either the bulbocavernosis or the transverse perineal muscles. Um, the second degree laceration would involve those muscles, um, the bulbocavernosis or the transverse perineal. Um, third degree lacerations are broken into 3A, and 3B, and these um, these lacerations involve the uh, the um, external anal sphincter uh, muscles, and so 3A is a little involves a little bit less of the external anal sphincter. I'd say less than 50%, and 3B, I believe, more than 50%. And then there's the fourth degree laceration, which is the most serious, uh, which extends all the way down into the um, the rectum. Now, how many types of uh, third degrees are there? I believe two. 3A and 3B. Okay. Now, what are risk factors for an obstetric anal sphincter injury? What increases those fact risk factors? What, what patients could have greater risk for that? So um, anybody with a operative vaginal delivery, whether it's vacuum or forceps, um, anybody with a uh, fetal macrosomia or large for gestational age baby, um, shoulder dystocia, nulliparity, um, anybody with prior, uh, for example, radiation to the vulva or um, immunocompromised state that causes a 
basically a decrease in that pelvic floor or perineal um, body, the strength of that perineal body. Um, other things, poorly controlled diabetes, uh, vascular disease, uh, to name a few. Is obesity a risk? Um, it, yes, it, it, it certainly could be, yes. I think it would be associated with um, fetal macrosomia as well. How about advanced maternal age? I believe so, um, but um, yes, I would say so, yes. So discuss for me how you repair, like what, what type of third degree occurred here? So with this patient, um, prior, we had- prior previous one. With her, yes, exactly. So I'm seeing her in office. During her delivery, she had a, a, par a partial third degree. So discuss for me how you repair, let's say, a 3B perineal laceration. So um, in somebody with a 3 with a, a 3B perineal laceration, I would first, um, I guess, get an assessment of um, of how deep the uh, of how of the severity of the laceration, so I would perform a rectal vaginal exam and ensure that um, it was a true uh, third degree, and then I would take my Alice clamps and um, I would place one on each side of the disrupted external anal sphincter muscle. Um, I would then take a zero vicral and place um, what are typically called PISA sutures. So post sutures, uh, posterior, inferior, superior, and anterior um, to my Alice clamps joining the uh, external anal sphincter. This can be joined in an end-to-end -end or in an overlapping fashion. After um, those sutures are placed, um, I will tie those sutures down. Um, cut the sutures, and then repair um, the rest of the perineal body using a 2 velasorb, um, placing, basically connecting the transverse perineal and the vulvocavernosus muscles, and then finally the, um, the vaginal mucosa. And uh, what, what would you do for the patient after the repair for assurance of proper integrity to that repair? Anything special that you would do? So after the repair, um, I would perform another rectovaginal exam just to ensure that um, I don't feel any sutures within the, the anal mucosa. Um, I would also uh, give her a dose of a uh, cephalosporin, so usually two grams of cefoxetin is uh, what I had done in my residency practice. And lastly, I would put her on stool softeners and counsel her against um, heavy weight bearing while she's recovering from the laceration. Why heavy weight bearing? I wouldn't want her to um, valsalva against the, the sutures in the same way that I wouldn't want, really want her straining to have a bowel movement. Sure about that? Um, typ typically, I, I have heard about this. You know, I, I have talked to patients about the stool softener, but um, now that I think in my practice, if I were still doing obstetrics, I would talk to them about um, watching their weight bearing, but I don't think that I've seen it, uh, I've heard it typically said. So you don't do obstetrics anymore? No, no, I'm a gynoc fellow. Okay. Um, well, how would you counsel the patient on a future mode of delivery? Let's say she comes to you pregnant at 12 weeks. So with her future delivery, I would counsel her that um, overall her, her risk of 
in in a healthy patient who, for example, might have had this patient in particular had a operative vaginal delivery, and um, if she were to have a repeat, if she were to opt for a repeat vaginal delivery, her risk of um, a repeat obstetric anal sphincter injury would be slightly higher than um, in the general population, but the overall risk of it is low between, um, I'd say about uh, two to 4%. Um, that being said, it is reasonable to discuss the alternative options, which might be a primary elective cesarean section for this patient, although I would uh, advise against it. So let's say the patient desires a vaginal delivery. What can you do in order to decrease her risk of repeat laceration? So um, in the next pregnancy, I could talk to her about um, about appropriate weight gain during pregnancy, monitor the baby's size, uh, make sure she doesn't have a, a fetus that has macrosomia. Um, um, during the uh, weeks leading up to delivery, I could counsel her about perineal massage and in the in the delivery, during the delivery period, I could use heat packs um, against the perineum to help decrease, and, and perineal pressure to help decrease the um, the tear, the risk of tearing. Anything else that you could do? Um, other than a perineal massage um, and uh, heat packs. You're overthinking it. Uh, push with control. Um, Something else. Uh, I'm. My brain is. I'm. I'm complete. I'm. I don't. I don't know. You do a right meter lateral episiotomy. Yes. Exactly. A right meter lateral episiotomy. Right. She won't tear. Yes, Don't do yeah. a midline. You do a an RML or OML if you're left-handed. Okay. That'll prevent a laceration, right? That's true. There you go. That is true, especially against the old scar line. Yes, you're right. Mhm. Mm yep. All right. We'll stop there. Very okay. nice. Questions. Um, thinking back, I don't. Is the third degree 3A and 3B, or is it partial third and complete third? It's an A, B, As I was and answering we'll question. A, B, and 3B, C. 3A, 3B, 3C. We'll go over it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anything else before we start? Um, no. Okay. So according to Practice Bulletin in 2018, a first degree is perineal skin. I trained, it was vaginal mucosa tear. But this is what it says, perineal skin. Second degree is perineal muscles. 3A is less than 50% of the external anal sphincter. 3B is greater than 50% of the external anal sphincter. 3C is external anal sphincter and internal anal sphincter. Hmm. Okay. Greater than 50% of, of, of uh, 3C of... of EAS and IAS, and then fourth degree is the, the mu vaginal muco um, rectal mucosa, EAS, IAS. But realistically, have no. you ever seen the internal anal sphincter? I know I have. No. No. <laughs> I don't know. They make it sound like it's this beautiful thing you could see very clearly. I've never seen it. So maybe I'm missing it. I don't know. Um, when you do a, an episiotomy or you have a second degree tear, is the bubble cavernosis or transverse perineal muscles that are cut, okay? Um, <laughs> risk factors for obstetric anal sphincter injury, operative vaginal delivery, midline episiotomy, macrosomia, longer second stage, OP position, increasing maternal age, obesity is not a risk factor. Mm -hmm. Okay, so increased maternal age is, but obesity is, is not. Okay. I'm sure the increasing maternal age is because of, you know, diabetes, probably, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong. Okay. 
So to repair the external anal sphincter, grasp the two severed ends of the dark red external anal sphincter muscle with Alice clamps. You may need to push Alice clamps into the surrounding connective tissue since once or both ends typically retract, right? That's the hard part, trying to find it. You can perform mm -hmm. either an end-to-end -end or an overlapping plication using interrupted or figure of eight sutures. Some people use zero. According to up to date, they use 2O or 3O PDS or 2O Vical. Mm -hmm. Place at least four to five interrupted sutures, depending on how big the tear is, so to speak. Um, you may need to mo sharply mobilize either sphincter ends to minimize tension for better anastomosis. Don't forget, once the sphincter is repaired, you may need to rebuild the distal rectal vaginal septum and perineal body, especially if you have a fourth degree. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sometimes you skip that that process because you want to build it, make it thicker that tissue. Um, mm -hmm. So to manage after the repair, a single dose of antibiotic at the time of repair is reasonable, especially with a fourth degree, third degree. If you said you said you didn't give antibiotics, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. Uh, but mm -hmm. further research is needed to determine routine administration to prevent complications. That's specifically for a fourth degree, according to the practice bulletin. Uh, avoid constipation, adequate pain control, focal, focus on local treatments, anesthetic sprays, ice, sits baths, consider pelvic physical therapy. They just, you know, strengthen that musculature down there. Mm -hmm. So, how do you counsel the patient on future mode of delivery? Expert opinion suggests that a woman may be offered a C-section if any of the following is noted. Anal incontinence, complication of a wound infection or need for repeat laceration repair, or patient expresses psychological trauma. Risk of repeat obstetric anal sphincter injury in a subsequent vaginal delivery is 3 to 5%. Okay. Okay. But I think you did good. Okay, thank you. Now I don't know that I don't know if it's good to say I don't practice obstetrics anymore. This is a general <laughs> OBGYN, and I know it's hard because you're an oncologist. Mm -hmm. It says right there, fellowship program cases. Mm -hmm. But I will try and shy away from that. Okay, thank you. That's that's good to especially, know. Especially especially for an MFM who's testing you for your OB section. What does she think? Hmm. Okay. Well, practice will be. Well, we're going to give her some hard questions now. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what they're going to think. I really don't. Trying to brush off those cobwebs. So um, this is helpful and good to know. Thank you. No, you did great. You did good. Very, very nice job. Other questions? Um, I just wanted to confirm, so mm -hmm. uh, so during a delivery, the only evidence-based way to decrease the risk of a, like a uh, perineal laceration would be the heat packs. Is that right? To my understanding, heat pack, perineal, perineal massage. I mean, think about it. If she's had that tear there before, that is an area of weakness. Uh -huh. So that tissue has a greater risk of, of breaking down again, right? And God forbid, mm -hmm. you know, she, she tears in the same way. Okay. It's much harder to repair a scar. Mm -hmm. yep. There's a lot of stuff involved in the process of, of having a bowel movement. So I've seen cases where, you know, it's a good repair, but the patient just is complaining of incontinence and stuff like that. So you don't, you know, you know, because it isn't like we get nerves and we put the nerves together and so you know what I'm saying? We just put this muscle together and hopefully it all works uh -huh. out, right? Uh -huh. So, you know, luckily when a patient has a partial third or whatever and she has no complication from it, that's fantastic. You know what I'm saying? So you uh -huh. like to avoid a repeat um episode of it. And, and and you know, I'm not an MFM, but I know some experts do not think you should offer a C section only in fourth degrees not third degrees, okay. but I'm not the patient. You know, if the patient's had, you know, a very trying time with her repair, I can understand her saying, no, no, I don't want to, I want to do this again. I wouldn't sure. fault her. You know, I'm not the one going through the, the issues that she went through. But while you have a patient who says, yes, I'd like to do it, you know, vaginal, I would definitely, without hesitation, do an episiotomy. Okay. 
because Thank that's you. the simplest way to, you know, decrease that energy. The energy has to go somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. Unless, you know, she's 32 weeks and the baby's just popping out, you know? Yep. You know, because God forbid it okay. breaks down in the same, the same place and then she has to go through all this all over again. Hopefully it does heal up properly because it is going to be repairing a scar. Yeah. Okay. No, but I all thought right. you did a good job. All right. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else want to be part of the heart seat? Alexandra. Oh, I have a question. Hold on, Alexandra. I'm going in your direction here in a second, but Aly Alyssa has a question. Let me ask. As far as a vacuum vaginal delivery is concerned, can you explain the less than 45 degree rotation with the outlet forcep vacuum? Well, to my understanding, Alyssa, with um, vacuum, you're not supposed to do any rotation whatsoever. No rotation whatsoever with vacuum. Um, I can't speak for outlet forceps because I do not do forceps, so I can't speak for that. But you're not supposed to do any rotations with a vacuum. That I can tell you 100%. Um, does that answer your question, Alyssa? Okay. Um, and then I have Jacqueline. I thought I remember something about doing a perineal stretch weeks before delivery and warm compresses in labor to reduce the risk of oasis. Did that change again in the practice bulletin? You know, I can't tell you, Jack. Jacqueline, if it specifically it said to do that in the practice bulletin, but I do know that's, you know, a lot of stuff that we recommend doing the perineal massage and there's nothing wrong with doing that. You're not hurting anything. Okay. So hopefully that answers your question, Jacqueline. Okay, Alexandria, I'm, I'm going in your direction. Says yourself muted. You're there, Alexandra? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah. So, are you a, a, a generalist or subspecialist? Generalist. Okay. And you're interested in a specific case? Uh, no. Anything is fine. What are you looking for? What are you looking for? Um, nothing specific. Whatever. I'm open. I mean, we just did OB, so we could do GYN or office. Okay. And you want something from your list? Let me just go to sure, that's area good. here. Okay. You said office? Sure. Oh, GYN. Now I can't remember what you said. What did you say? I don't know. What did you say? Yeah, office. Wasn't paying fine. attention. No, you said okay. office? Yeah. I wasn't paying attention. You said something. I was trying to look for your list. It's okay. So much for, multi so much for multitasking, right? <laughs> so case number two. So this patient presents saying, you know, I'm not happy with the next plan on. Mm -hmm. Discuss the counseling you undertook with the patient in regards to her different options. Yes. So as you mentioned, she came to me. Her biggest complaint uh, with the next plan on um, was her unpredictable bleeding. Um, she had been counseled before placement that this is the most common complaint um, due to irregular spotting or just unpredictable bleeding patterns. Um, once she came to me, I counseled her on possibly doing a trial um, of oral contraceptive pills to help stabilize her bleeding so that she could have a more predictable bleeding. And um, So what's I, the reasoning behind that? The reasoning behind putting her on a trial of oral yeah. contraceptive pills? Yes. To stabilize her endometrium. And so that she could have a more predictable um, bleeding so pattern. Why do, why do you have to stabilize the endometrium? Um, at this point, so with the next one on, it is a progesterone only form of birth control. And so what does it contain? 
Say that again, I'm sorry. What does it contain? It's heteronorgestrel. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. And how many milligrams? I am not sure on the milligrams. I'd have to look it up. And what is its specific mechanism of action? So with the Nexplanon, it's going to thicken cervical mucus. Um, and that's the main mode or the main mechanism of action by thickening the cervical mucus. Um, it's preventing sperm from reaching um, the uterus and fallopian tube. Are you sure about that? I believe that is the main form of the mechanism of action, yes. Okay, so go back to why do you have to um, give them the trial of the OCPs? So with the trial of OCPs, um, the mechanism of action of those is to inhibit her from ovulating. And by doing that, you have a better... So let me ask you, so the next plan on, you still ovulate with the next plan on? Is that what you're saying? I, I believe about 50% of patients on the next plan on are still ovulating. Okay. Um, so by doing a trial of OCPs, your their main mechanism of action is to inhibit ovulation. Um, and then you have a better control of um, their bleeding pattern because their endometrium is then not stimulated to grow. Um, and that way they have a more predictable bleeding pattern. So their endometrium is not stimulated to grow. With the next one on, it's stimulated to grow? If they're ovulating, yes, they can. Okay, continue. Well, let me ask you, what, which type of, uh, which OCP did you recommend and why? Um, with her in particular, I believe we chose Sprintech. Why Sprintech? That's typically my go-to birth control. Um, I'd have to look so at her. Is, 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 is Sprintech uh, triphasic? It is, yes. So how is that going to help stabilize the endometrium? I'm not sure. I'd have to look it up. Would monophasic be better? Possibly, yes. Okay, continue. Um, so with her, she, again, I'd have to double check to make sure to see if it was sprint tech that we started. That's just usually my go-to. Um, but she did decide to do the trial of oral contraceptive pills before removing the next one on, and she is to this day tolerating it well. Um, she did the trial of OCPs for three months and then has now had a lessened bleeding pattern or to the point where her, she's not getting periods. On the sprint tech? No, she did the sprint tech for three months and then okay. she stopped and has a now virtually very minimal bleeding with her periods or virtually none. But she, the next non was removed? No. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm looking okay. at a different, I'm thinking of someone else. Yes, her next one on Okay. Okay. And she's on her oral contraceptive pills, yes. So she's still on the pill? Yes. So can you tell, can you just discuss other options that are available to the patient? For birth control? Yep. Well, yeah. like she said, you know, I'm not happy with the next plan. You just say, here, let's try the pill. Or do you give her all these other options that are available? No, we went all, I like to discuss with my patients all options that are available to her. So we did discuss the other forms of long acting reversible contraception, such as the IUD. Um, we also talked about OCPs. We talked about um, the patch, the NuvaRing, um, and Depo-Provera. So what is the mechanism of action of Depo-Provera? Deprovera is also a progesterone only form of birth control. And you know what? I am drawing a complete blank right now as to how Depo Provera works. So, what are contraindications to the IUD? Contraindications to IUD is. Um, it depends on the form of IUD, whether it's hormonal versus a copper IUD. If it, we're talking copper IUD, any sort of allergy um, to copper itself um, would be contraindicated. For um, IUD placement, if she was having um, an irregular uterus or known to have a uterine anomaly or 
possibly a large fibroid where I know she maybe was just going to um, not tolerate either insertion or I knew that it was going to fall out easier or be, you know, expulsed easier, um, then you wouldn't want to do it. Generally, overall, um, most women do tolerate IUDs well um, as far as the risk of, you know, contraindications to IUDs. Any other contraindications? I'm sure, yes, but I can't think of anything right now. And what are the different types of IUDs available? So again, there's, I like to divide them into hormonal versus non-hormonal. So hormonal, um, you have, there's different ones on the market. The most commonly that I see in my practice is the Mirena IUD. Um, it is going to have 52 milligrams of levonorgestrel. There's also the Lyletta. Oh, and I mean, the difference is also how long um, women can have IUDs. So the Mirena would be good for, it recently approved for eight years. There is the um, Kylina, which is also levonorgestrel, and that's going to have 19.5 milligrams of the progesterone, and it's good for up to five years. The Lyletta is, I'm drawing a blank on the dose, but it is approved for six years. Um, and then the Skyla IUD is going to be improved, approved for three years. And then and when you- and oh, what medication does it contain? Uh, levonorgestrel. How much? For the Skyla, I'm also drawing a blank. I believe it is a lesser dose. So what causes more amenorrhea, the Mirena or the Kylina? The Mirena. The Kylina and the Skyla? The Kylina. Do you know what percent? For amenorrhea with the Kylina, I do not know the percentage. So why would somebody pick a Kylina versus a Mirena? So I know there's a difference in the dose of the Kylina and also the size of the Kylina. It's significantly smaller. Well, not significantly, I'm sorry. It's just slightly smaller. So it was, or it is marketed towards um, primogravid or women who have not been pregnant. Um, so that would be possibly, you know, someone who's never been pregnant before may have a more comfortable experience with insertion since it is a slightly smaller device. Any other types of IUDs available? And then there's the non-hormonal, which is the Paragard or the copper IUD. And what are um, some cons, for lack of a better word, of the uh, copper IUD? So with the copper IUD, one of the side effects, um, which can be bothersome, it can lead to heavy menstrual bleeding, particularly in patients who already have a history of heavy menstrual bleeding. Um, so they, not, they may not be the best candidates um, for the copper IUD. Okay, let's stop there. What'd you think? Um, I'm not great at birth control pills, so I need to definitely study that more. Well, you know, if you wanted to beef, for lack of a better word, up the lining of the uterus, I don't know if a triph triphasic would be the way to go. I would do a more monophasic. Yeah, okay. You know? Yeah. You know, I mean, because they, they could ask, you know, why'd you pick this pill versus this other pill and this, that, and the other? Yeah. Because they do stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Um, in regards to contraindications to IUD, severe distortion of the uterine cavity, active pelvic infection, pregnancy, unexplained, abnormal uterine bleeding, Wilson's disease, copper allergy, you said that, current breast cancer. This is according to uh, up to date. Really? Um, okay. Levonogestrol, 52 milligrams, the Mirena. And to my understanding, the Liletta also has 52 milligrams. Oh, okay. Don't quote me, but I believe it does. Okay. Amenorrhea rate is 20 to 40 percent, and you are correct. Um, it has now been approved for eight years, the Mirena. However, five years still for AUD. Okay. The Kylina is 19.5 milligrams, and it's an amenorrhea rate of 12 to 20 percent. Skyla is 13.5 milligrams of levonorgestrel, an amenorrhea rate of 6 to 12 percent. Okay because it has less.
Okay, yeah. to my understanding, Depo-Provera's main mechanism of action is it prevents ovulation by not allowing the LH surge. Okay. It also thickens the, the cervical mucus. The endometrium is not a, a good environment for sperm, but its main mechanism of action is preventing ovulation or inhibiting ovulation. The next planon is the same thing. Okay. For the first two years of placement. It inhibits ovulation, it prevents LH surge. However, towards the third year, towards that end of that third year of its, this is according to the practice, uh, it's in, uh, the manufacturer, you know, right. you call it, the prescribing information, because I read it. Okay. As you go towards the third year, you may ovulate. So okay. the thickening of the cervical mucus, the environment not being conducive for the sperm or for implantation, comes into play okay it contains 68 milligrams of edonogestrel oh i knew that okay okay mm -hmm. um other questions what else did i ask you um i don't think i have any i just have to review all of this and get more comfortable no i thought you did well Oh, thank you. I don't know how, how many milligrams the the Kylina had? Yeah. <laughs> Good for you. I mean, you know. Thank you. You're correct. You know, it's the smaller size and and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, you did bring up the patch. You brought up the Nuva ring. So you got to know the mechanism of action, what it contains, so on and so forth. So who would not be a good candidate for the patch? Um. Anyone with a skin sensitivity to it, but oh man, there's something else. Mm -hmm. Your weight. Yes, that's what it is. Yeah, it's less. Okay. It's less effective for anybody. Is according to the package insert, greater than 198 pounds. Okay. 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 And there yeah. is the consideration of um, you have a greater risk of VTE, the more that's obese you are. Oh uh, yeah. Okay because uh, it's half-life lasts longer. There's a, there's a uh, I think UpToDate has a really nice chart of showing how they did a study, but remember, don't say studies or anything like that in this exam, mm -hmm. um, saying how the half-life is much longer in somebody who's obese, which is kind of intuitive, then why is it less effective? But well, what do I know? Yeah, weird, okay. Something like that. It's I, I'm blanking right now, but it's 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 a very nice little chart. My my, okay. my memory serves me correctly. No, no, but good job. For Thank you. You're not very good with uh, birth control. I know with the OCPs. I just yeah. I definitely it's on my list of things I need to study. So um, I have Liletta. Yes, it's 52 milligrams. Thank you, Dr. Burton. Appreciate it. Now, how do OCPs improve irregular bleeding with Nexplanon? In my oh. opinion, and this is for Anisha, it would be more to thicken the, because the lining of the uterus thins out because of the progesterone, you want to beef it up with the estrogen. That's the way I see it. So you could have given her, like, I, I don't know if you do this in your practice, but someone went on the depo, Provera, they complain of that irregular bleeding. You could give mm -hmm. them some, some Premarin and see if that would beef up that lining and, and decrease that irregular bleeding. Now, I know this was many, 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 many years ago when Nexplanon first came out, people were complaining of the irregular bleeding. So, I don't know, some geniuses did a study and they gave them Doxy and that improved their bleeding. But why would Doxy improve your bleeding? Unless you had endometritis or chronic endometritis. So that never yeah. made sense to me. But it makes mm -hmm. better sense to give somebody estrogen so there's nothing wrong with giving her OCPs. Right. But you can give her just Premarin on its own. Does that answer okay. your question, Anisha? Well, hopefully it does. So that's that's why you, you gave it to her. Yeah, perfect. Now, again, why a tricyclic? Uh, I don't know about that. that yeah. Be more monophasic. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you so okay. much. I appreciate it. No, no worries. Good job. Thanks. So she's saying, is that off-label use for the OCP use for night? Of course it is. Yeah, Kendra, it is. Could you also give NSAIDs? Yes, Ebro's, the same concept of, of with that study, they did Doxy and NSAIDs, and it worked. I don't know the, the pathology behind it. Um, 
but it makes better sense to give somebody the estrogen in, in my eyes as, as a gynecologist. Okay. So, um, yeah, so that's also something you could do is the NSAIDs. Again, I don't, the pathophys doesn't make any sense to me. Um, but yeah, that, that is another option. Because you give NSAIDs to kind of decrease the bleeding that somebody may have who has heavy bleeding. But if you have irregular bleeding, how would NSAIDs help? Hmm. Makes no sense. But some studies have shown that. Again, you don't say studies on this fine exam. Okay. Um, anybody else want to be part of the hot seat? Gabrielle, I'm going in your direction. It says you're self-muted. Still says you're self-muted. Oh, look like it almost turned. We had it and then we, here we go. Are you there? Yeah. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Awesome. Are you interested in a specific case or? Um, no, you can just pick whatever. Pick anything. You want a topic? What you looking for? Yeah, you can give me a topic. That would be fine. A topic. What are you looking for? GYN, OB? Um, let's do um, either OB or GYN. You're a generalist or subspecialist? Generalist. Okay. Have we talked about AIS before? We have not. All right, well, let's do that. How's that? Okay. You're like, oh boy. <laughs> oh boy. Okay, so you have a patient who you do a, she has an abnormal pap that mm -hmm. can favor AIS. You do your COPO and it confirms AIS. How would you manage that? Uh, so I would counsel a patient that I would want to perform a cold knife cone biopsy um, to give clear margins and for me to sample, have adequate sampling. Um, so I will counsel her for a cold knife cone and an ECC procedure. So why, I guess, what is worrisome about AIS? Uh, so AIS, um, has a underlying risk, um, I would say 10 to 20% um, for having a adenocarcinoma and also has skip lesions. So it's um, more worrisome to us too and wanting to get a full um, excisional biopsy. So a leap is not recommended? You can do a leap, but um, a cold knife cone is preferred. So what differentiates between the two? Like why it's preferred, but you said you could do a leap. Um, because you want to get at least, um, you want a full specimen, you want to get full margins um, that are clear and not burnt. Um, and you want to get um, deep at least one centimeter. Um, in the uh, the endocervix. So let's say you do a cone biopsy, and then the margins are positive for adenocarcinoma in situ. How would you manage that? Um, so if the margins are positive, um. I will counsel the patient that I would want her to follow up with gynecology oncologist. Um, I would also discuss her desire for future fertility um, because that can distinguish um, what her follow up. So let, let's say, let's say she, she desires future children. Um, what would the oncologist tell her? Or do for uh, her, for lack of a better so, word. Yeah, so if she desires future fertility, um, and our margins are clear, then we could repeat um, the excision um, to see if we get clear margins. Um, she would also need close monitoring um, with co-testing and ECC every six months for three years and then yearly for two years or um, 
uh, yeah, or uh, um, yearly until she desires um, desires uh, to get a hysterectomy. So let's say the um, she does she did not want to have any further children. Mm -hmm. She had the positive margins. Um, so I think uh, she would have to still be um, followed up with gynecology oncology because I think they would recommend um, not only a hysterectomy but maybe a um, modified radical hysterectomy for her. So when is the decision to make a modified radical hysterectomy? Um, if the margins are clear and uh, it favors invasive disease. So if let's say the patient had the positive margins and she wants a hysterectomy, you're saying she needs a comb biopsy? Or she can uh, have she can go straight to a hysterectomy? She can go straight to a um, hysterectomy. But you just said that the oncologist could do a modified radical yeah. hysterectomy. Yeah. So what, what, is the what is the correct answer? If the margin... Is... Go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. I think if the margins um, are involved and she wants to proceed with a hysterectomy, it would be a modified radical hysterectomy. So if she had positive margins, then you would do a modified hysterectomy, modified radical hysterectomy. Correct. If the margins were negative, you would do just a regular hysterectomy. Correct. Could you have done that hysterectomy? Um, I could do a simple hysterectomy, but I would prefer um, the gynecologist, the gynon to do it. Why? Um, yeah, I guess I could do the simple hysterectomy. Now, let's say the patient tells you, I want the hysterectomy done as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. What's the earliest that you would schedule her? Mm. Um, I would want to schedule her. Um, Within a month. Why a month? I, I really, I don't know the answer to this. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I just won't. Um, I'm not sure. If she said, you call the you call the patient, and uh, she had the AIS. Mm -hmm. Her margins were negative, and she's like, "Well, I'm done having kids, doc. I want hysterectomy as soon as possible. Can I have it done like three days from now? Would you be accommodating?" Or you'd say, "Nope, you got to wait a month," even though you're not sure why you wait a month. <laughs> Um, yeah, I guess we could do it. It's just that I guess I'm not sure if we should wait until it's healed or um, why would it be smart to wait till she healed? Yeah, because it could increase any infection or um, or like a difficulty with. Difficulty in what? <laughs> or, yeah, I'm not sure. You're on the right direction. Difficulty with what? Um, uh, with uh, during the surgery to put um the instruments for manipulation. And uh, what do you mean by manipulation? Uh, the uterine manipulator. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. I don't know. <laughs> so what? What is the? Okay. What is the risk of AIS with yeah. negative margins? 
Yeah, yeah. So with negative margins. So you did her cone. She had negative margins. What is the risk that she still has AIS? Yeah, approximately probably twenty percent with ischemic lesions. Okay. Now, what is the risk of adenocarcinoma if she had negative margins in that cone biopsy? Um, I'm not sure the full percentage, but I would say probably ten to fifteen percent. Okay. Let's stop there. What would okay. you think? Oh, I don't know about that last part. <laughs> We'll go over it. Yeah, okay. Any questions specifically? No. Because they're going to say that. You're going to refer to oncology. What's oncology going to do? Yeah. Right? That's true. So you're correct. AIS is concerning because negative margins does not necessarily ensure complete removal of the lesion. You have your skip lesions. Okay? Yeah. So anybody who has a history of AIS and is done with childbearing should have a complete history should have a hysterectomy that is the definitive treatment okay okay if they're interested in having children you you you, you know hold on that so if you have a cone biopsy and by the way you do not do a leap you must do a cone with AIS period mm -hmm. there's no you were correct, and then you kind of waffled and said, oh, well, you could do, yeah, no. That's one of the cases where you have to do a cone, no leap, because yeah. you need to have clear margins, very clear margins. Mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. So let's say she had positive margins and wanted a hysterectomy. She has to have another cone biopsy. Okay. Okay. And you were correct, but your reasoning was kind of circulatory. <laughs> the reason is because it's a different hysterectomy yeah. if she had some invasion. And it would be a modified radical hysterectomy. Okay? Yeah. So you need to repeat the cone to rule out exclude invasive disease. It avoids performing only an extra fascial hysterectomy, which is what you know how to do. That's a simple hysterectomy in the mm -hmm. setting of occult invasive cancer that should be staged. So you yourself, if she had a cone biopsy with negative margins, had AIS, and said, I want, a I'm done having children, I want a hysterectomy, you could do it yourself because it's a simple hysterectomy, what we all do, okay? We're not oncologists, okay? okay. Mm -hmm. Now, let's say she wants the surgery done as soon as possible. You either do it 48 hours, hmm. within 48 hours of the first surgery, or six weeks after the the surgery and the reason is you want no inflammatory changes because then it's very difficult to identify the planes and it makes it a much more difficult surgery okay okay you were kind of in the right direction and you kind of lost it <laughs> you didn't manipulate her i didn't know what you meant by that okay i know oh yeah <laughs> so the risk of ais with negative margins is 10 percent because of the skip lesions the risk of adenocarcinoma with negative margins is 1%. And that's from up to date. Okay. Okay? Yeah, thank you. So questions? No, no, you did good. Good overall. Thank you. It's not an easy topic. Yeah. But a generalist should know. So there you have it. Tricks are for kids. Questions? No, that was good. Thank you. You did great. Thank you so much. All right. I'm just trying to make sure nobody has any questions here. Okay, hold on. Okay, hold on a second. So SprintTech is monophasic and tri-SprintTech is triphasic formulation. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. So hopefully that'll help out Alexandra. So I'm thinking tri-SprintTech. Okay, very good. Thank you, Stephanie. So yeah, definitely in this case, I would do more monophasic. So I guess Sprint Tech is monophasic. So you're okay, Alexandra. Okay. But you still should know what type of OCP you're giving the patient. So why not mention studies on the exam? Because they're going to ask you what studies. If you can't quote the study, you're in trouble. Does that help you, Megan? So then I have if margins. 
I got a bunch of questions. Hold on. I'm here trying to end and just questions keep popping up. So if margins are negative on the coal knife cone, can you perform a simple hysterectomy? Yes, you can. To my understanding, Matthew. Can you repeat the risks of AIS with positive margins? Oh, if you have positive margins, then you, you still have AIS. So if you have negative margins, does that make sense, Evros? So if you have negative margins, the risk of still having, because um, if you have positive margins, you still have the AIS. Does that make sense? That, does, that doesn't change. It's still there. So if you had negative margins on your cone with AIS initially, it's a 10% still risk that the AIS is there because of the skip lesions. And then the risk of adenocarcinoma with those negative margins is 1%. Okay, so hopefully that clarifies that, Ebros. So it says, for AIS, if the endocervical margin is positive, but ectocervical margin is negative, do you still need to repeat the cone? I believe so, because uh, it's your AIS is still present in your endocervical margin. Okay? I would say yes. Okay? Lauren, hope that helps you. It says, can you please repeat the risks of adenocarcinoma AIS with an already done cold knife cone with negative margin? Hopefully, Melissa, that answers your question. Can we go over fourth degree laceration repair? We didn't go over the fourth degree. We did a third degree, Andrea, but we can go over it if you want. Let me just finish up with anybody has any other AIS questions. Oh, okay, I see what Lauren wrote. So if the endocervical margin is positive, but ectocervical margin is negative, you st I still would repeat the cone, Lauren, before a hysterectomy. Yes, 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 I would. If positive margin is unable to repeat cone, ooh. That's a tough one. That one I would refer to oncology. I would refer that to oncology, Rita, because I, I wouldn't know what to tell you. Yep, that's a tough one because you still have the positive margins. So yeah, the key here is you have to do the, the, the cone again. So yeah, that would be an oncology referral, 100%. Um, Anisha saying, could you do a trachelectomy? Yes, you can. Okay. Uh, okay, I don't know with positive margins. Can you do a trachelectomy if you have positive margins? No, I think you have to do the cone again. But if she wants to do a trachelectomy, I'd be referring to the oncologist anyway. You know? Would, it, would a trachelectomy be appropriate in a patient who desires pregnancy? Yes, yes, it, it would be, Andrea. Yep. Okay, so fourth degree repair, fourth degree laceration here. Okay, so you repair the anal mucosa using a continuous non-locking 3-0 or 4-0 vicryl on a tapered needle. You can also use monocryl. Interrupted sutures can be performed but will result in a larger amount of foreign body because of the multiple knots. The internal anal sphincter often retracts laterally and superiorly and appears as a thickened, pale pink, shiny tissue just above the anal mucosa that some clinicians refer to the perirectal fascia. I personally have never seen it, I guess in a perfect world. Continuous 3O Vicro or 3O PDS on a tapered needle. The external anal sphincter, you grasp the two severed ends of the dark red external anal sphincter muscle with alice clamps. You may need to push the alice clamps into the surrounding connective tissue since one or both ends typically retract. Perform either an end to end or overlapping plication using interrupted or figure of eight sutures. 2O or 3O PDS or 2O Vicro on a cut, tapered one or two needle. Place at least four or five interrupted sutures. Usually four, because you're putting it like, you know, for lack of a better word, like in a circle, like in a circle, like at two, four, for lack of, even though it's coming in and out, eight and 10, so to speak. Um, you may need to sharply mobilize either the sphincter end to minimize tension for better anastomosis. After the sphincter is repaired, you need to rebuild the distal rectal vaginal septum and perineal body. This helps maintain the proper spatial distance between the anus and vagina and may prevent suture erosion from the deeper layers. Another goal of this layer is to 
help take tension off of the underlying sphincter repair. Using a tool of micro on a cutting lead, needle, repair second degree in a routine fashion, however you do that. So hopefully that answers your question there, Anish, um, Andrea. So I know I'm going to say his name wrong. J. Ron says ASCCP states that if margins are positive and unable to repeat excision, then simple hiss or modified radical hiss can be considered. Of course, you'd be referring her at that point to um, oncology. You would not do that as, as a generalist, okay? So thank you for that information, Jaron. All righty, anybody else? I think we got all the questions answered. If I didn't, please put stuff in the box. because I think I saw we answered everything that I could see because there was just questions just popping up left and right. So hopefully that answers your questions, guys. Please let me know if I didn't get to yours. Anybody else wants to be part of the hot seat? Laurel, I'm going in your direction. It says you're self-muted. Hi. Hey, how we doing? I'm good. How are you? Living the dream. What can I tell you? Or living the nightmare, depending on how you see it. Um, are you looking for a specific case? No. Any... What you looking for? Um, I'm... poison. Either, I would say OB or GYN is fine. Something from your list or just some, yeah, are you a generalist or a subspecialist? Generalist, something from my list is good. Okay. Let me go find it. You said OB, correct? Yeah, OB, that's perfect. Okay. People say things, and I'm just tuning it off while I'm looking for your, your list, so apologies. Okay, so give me a second to review this. No particular case that's bothersome? Um, not that I can think of. Case 21, can you discuss what happened in this case? Okay, um, so this patient was scheduled for um, an elective induction um, at 40 weeks and four days. And um, labored, uh, she was, uh, she was, uh, she was basically, she had cervical ripening done with a Foley balloon and Pitocin. And, um, once the Foley bloom came out, she was noted to be like about four centimeters. And, um, it felt like it was a little bit difficult to assess. She was still pretty posterior, but it felt as though, um, there was like potentially some formation of face presentation. Um, however, the baby, the, the fetal head wasn't um, particularly deep in the pelvis. So we allowed her to, allowed her to labor and she continued Pitocin. Um, however, I monitored her closely and checked her. And when I, um, ruptured her and checked her later, I could feel that the baby's face was um, meant um, posterior with a face presentation. Um, and she was so, she was still four centimeters after a so significant time. After a significant what? Period of time. It had been about, um, it had been over six hours. So what type of face presentation can deliver vaginally? Uh, mentum anterior can. Now, it would be possible that the mentum posterior could have rotated? It's possible that it could. Um, however, 
after she was ruptured and laboring, um, the way that the presentation of the fetal vertex felt, it had was felt like I couldn't really, it was pretty well applied. It was well engaged. What was she? She was about, mm, she was maybe minus two. Um, so to but, say she was a she was brow presentation. What would you do in that situation? Brow presentation. Mm -hmm. Um, I would probably do the same thing. And basically, I counseled her that we could continue to allow her to labor to see if um, the fetus would you know, change position and potentially come down in a more favorable position, um, or if she continued to change, you know, but she, uh, after counseling and discussing with her and, um, she, she did decide to move forward with the transverse with a C-section. And, um, so you said you waited up to six hours and there was no change. Um, we waited, I can't remember the exact timeline. I would have to look back. Um, but she, after the after I felt that she was face presentation, um, it was probably in the six to twelve hour range that she got pitocin, and we and I ruptured her, and we allowed her to continue to labor and to try and see if um, the presentation would change at all, and nothing seemed to change. Except for so maybe she was brow. Yeah, go ahead. Except for I was except for maybe a little bit of descent, um, within the same but position. Still, but still, with a mental posterior. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so you would do the same thing for a brow. Yes. So what happens with a brow presentation? What does it become? Um, it becomes. Um, a brow presentation would become I am not sure actually um so let's say you had a transverse position can you tell me what you would do in in, in what the different types of transverse in their delivery I'm talking about uh, the transverse position of the baby so um if I mean if the if the fetal head was transverse during no, labor. Not the, fetal head. the ba the ba the baby's body's transverse. Oh the baby's body's transverse. Okay, yes. sorry. Um so if the baby's body is transverse, like I'm noted I'm finding this out in labor. No, 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 no. You have a patient who's in transverse she's transverse. How okay. would you manage her? How would you deliver her? So I would um, want to know exactly if she was, um, which way she was transverse, so if she was transverse um, back down or if she was transverse back up, um, which... Why is that important? That'd probably be the most important thing I'd want to know just because um, if the baby was transverse back down and I made a um, low transverse C-section, there's potential that'd be very difficult to grab a presenting limb since nothing would be in the lower human segment. So However, which, which type of back back presentation? Back down. Back down. Okay. Would be, the, would be difficult to deliver with a low transverse. Okay. Back up there would, you know, there could be feet um, in the lower uterine segment so I could deliver breach through a low transverse um, incision. So let's say you have the back down. How would you deliver that patient? Um, if the back was down, I, I mean, I could potentially try to do, offer the patient a version, um, if that was something that was, if, you know, if she wasn't in labor, if this was something that was, um, she met criteria for. And what is criteria, or I guess, what are contraindications to aversion? Contraindications to aversion would be, um, oligohydramnios, active labor, um, rupture of fluids, um, uh, 
Um, I mean, let me ask you this. What are absolute contraindications to aversion? Because you could still do aversion with oligo, correct? You, it's definitely not, I don't, it's not recommended. You might not be successful. Um, but feel, it's not a contraindication. Okay, it, a relative contraindication, I suppose, yeah. Um, uh, Non-reassuring fetal heart tracing. Um, if, you know, the patient declined it, wasn't willing to have like an emergency C-section. Um, if How about a prior C-section? For abruption or a previa. Is a prior C-section a contraindication? Uh, no. And you said rupture membrane is a contraindication? It's a, it's a, I suppose it's a relative contraindication. I would not do one just because the success rate is low. Well, let's say she doesn't want an external cephalic version. So how would you deliver her? I, um, I would, um, I would counsel her beforehand that she may need a, um, a classical incision in her uterus, meaning a vertical. She may need it or will she need it? She, she may. Um, what do you mean I, by may? So sometimes uh, I have in the past been able to do a low transverse incision and then potentially also if needed T the uterus. Um, and Let I've, me interrupt here. I'm confused. You said that if you were back down, there would yeah. be difficulty in grabbing the legs. Yes. But now you're saying you could do a low segment transverse? Um, if you weren't able or, to. Or, or I'll tee the uterus. So sometimes um, during the delivery, you can, like once the abdomen is open, you can potentially do some sort of version to make the baby breach or um, while you're. Are you sure about how would you do that? You can manipulate the, the uterus externally. That's before your incision? Uh, before the incision. And you're successful in doing that? I Visually? have been in the past, I have in the past done a, uh, done low transverse C-sections with back down where we, and where we did have to tee the uterus um, to help with delivery. All right, let's stop there. Because if, if, the, if it's back down, you have to do a classical. Okay. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. Okay. Teeing the uterus is called failure. Okay. Right? Sometimes you got to do it, right? Okay. But you're better off doing a classical than teeing the uterus because definitely that area where the T is is extremely weak. Right. So you're better off doing the classical. Okay. Now, I mind you, there are situations that you have to tee the uterus. Right. Sometimes the breech's head gets stuck. Sometimes with twins, you have issues with that second twin. So there's nothing wrong in your counseling to tell the patient, you're a candidate for a low segment transverse. However, if I run into difficulty in delivering the baby, I am not going to struggle and I will do a T to the uterus. And unfortunately, you will not be able to deliver vaginally ever again. But that's, you know, sometimes it happens even with a low segment transverse and the best hands, you sometimes have to T that uterus for whatever reason. But to say, yeah, I think I was going off. I, I, ha <laughs> I have I have a back down, and I'm just gonna see if I can vert that baby. Ooh, yeah. I, I don't think they're gonna fly on that one. Okay, yeah. I don't know why I was going in that direction. I feel yeah, like I yeah, felt yeah. like I was saying it was too definite to always do a classical. I don't know. You have to do a classical. I mean, that's okay. one of the cases that you do a classical. There's nothing okay. you can do. How successful are you gonna be in verting the baby? Heck, man, I've never seen anybody do it. Once you uh, you open the patient, you know, you get a feel and stuff like that, you know. Um, but I've seen situations where like, you know, they did an LST and then they end up teeing the uterus and the kid delivers vaginally. Uh, excuse me, the, the, the kid delivers ver via vertex, but that's because you opened the uterus well enough and you were able to flip the kid somehow. But probably you wouldn't have been able to do that if you hadn't teed the uterus. Does that make right. sense? Yeah. So, yeah, that, I think. I, Just, I don't think the, the examiners would be happy with saying I'd do an LST with back down. Okay. Okay, yeah. back up. 
that's different because you can grab the legs, right? Yep. Okay. Um, so you're correct. Mentum posterior cannot deliver vaginally. It's mentum anterior. So with a brow, you can end up becoming a face or you end up the brow going in and it's just a regular vertex, right? But of course that's never going to happen. It ends up being the face. So, <laughs> so yeah. then it comes back to the mentum posterior. You really can't deliver vaginally. Right. Okay. It has to be mentum anterior. So external cephalic version, contraindicated, previa, abruption, non-reassuring fetal heart, significant fetal or uterine anomaly, hyperextended fetal head. Rupture of membranes and prior C-section are not contraindications. That's according to up-to-date. So literally, and I think also if a lady has a BMI of 60, are you going to be really able to do an external cephalic version on that patient? Let's be honest. Probably not well. I don't think so. I think that's, you're not going to be even feel her uterus. Feel the uterus. That's probably. You know, let's be honest. Um, so questions, I'm trying to think, because you have a face presentation. I could see them start asking you about mal presentation. Yeah, no, I think that makes sense. I, yeah. Okay. Other questions. Okay, great job, Laurel. Okay. Michelle, I'm going to be going in your direction. But let me make sure I have everybody's questions answered here. Give me a second. Okay. Uh, can't you just do a low vertical with a back down? Hmm. That's a Lisa asking that question. It's yeah, I, I guess you can with the understanding you may have to go up to the muscle. So then the patient won't be able to um, have a vaginal delivery in the future. Okay. I guess you can, um, but you may have to extend. Okay. Because um, remember, you need space to, to try and grab those legs. Okay. So I guess you can start low vertical, but then if you go into that muscle layer, that's it. She's not a candidate for a VBAC. So then Bianca says, if transverse back down, she gets a classical or has a T incision with low segment transverse. Either way, delivery would be re-PC section 36, 37 weeks. Could you consider trying LT? Um, I'm going to be honest with you, Bianca. I wouldn't. I wouldn't because the T incision is kind of like a failure, so to speak. And it's a weaker area, supposedly. I mean, the recommendation is to do the classical if the back is down. Okay. Correct. Either way, you're getting that repeat C but there's no way you're going to be really able to do deliver that baby with the back down. You can't grab anything because all you have is the back. So that's why you got to do the classical. Okay. So it's you're better off doing the classical from the get go because it's much easier to repair that classical incision than that T. Okay. So hopefully that answers your question, Bianca. To do back down preemies get classical as well? Yes. Anything back down, it's classical because you cannot grab any leg. Okay. With the back up, you can grab the legs and pull the baby out as a breech, but you can't do that with the back up. Okay. You were asking about timing of waiting for mentum posterior. Do they have to be ruptured or a certain dilation? Uh, Matthew, not to my understanding if she's not progressing. The thing is, you're hoping that posterior, when they're mentum posterior, they start flipping to anterior. But if they're not rotating, she cannot deliver vaginally. You're hyperextending that neck and it's not going to work. So you have to kind of, if, if you see she's not rotating, then you have to just do the C-section because then it's detrimental to the baby. Okay, so ho hopefully that answers your question, Matthew. So I have here, sorry, maybe dumb question. Are you ask, saying all T-verse back up will need to be delivered by grabbing legs? Is there no way to deliver head first? 
um, it's going to be tough. I mean, maybe you'll be able to grab the, the head somehow and bring it down, but it's much easier to deliver as a breach by grabbing the legs. Because it's easier to grab the extremities than you are to grab the head. So that's what you're supposed to do in somebody who's back up is to do the low segment transverse and then deliver as a breach, okay? And then have, you do a classical routine incision when baby is back down transverse at term. I would do a classical. I wouldn't do a T incision. I would do a classical if it's back down because you cannot grab the legs in a low segment transverse. You need to be able to kind of make that cut in the myometrium so you can grab, put your hand in there and grab those legs. You can't do that in the low segment because you're hitting the back, right? You can't get the legs. If the baby is back up, so the back towards the mom head, then you can grab those legs. So hopefully that makes sense there, Andrea. Okay, so hopefully I answered everybody's questions. Please let me know if I didn't, okay? Michelle, I'm heading your direction. You're there, Michelle? Yes. Awesome. So where is your case? Um, I have a OB case. I think it's number okay, 64. Okay, give me a second. Let's go find it. So C4, okay. 33-year-old, grab it a 13. Yes. Am I correct? Yes. Hold on, let me just lower it here a little bit so everybody can see it. All right, present the case for me. So this is a 33-year-old uh, G13P7057. Um, she first came to see me at 38 weeks <clears throat> um, with a history from of where? six from, where? Uh, from, where? from a outside, outside midwifery care. Um, <clears throat> she, she had a history of six, six previous C-sections previous and that she was under midwifery care. Yes. Nice. Okay, um, she was noted to have a low lying placenta early in her uh, pregnancy and then um, just got to this point where she always got to this point in her pregnancies and her midwifery strongly recommended her seeing me and here we are. <clears throat> so I saw her. So let me ask you, right. so let me ask, let me ask you this. What is the risk of a placenta accreta with a previa? With your fifth C-section, it's above sixty. It's it's probably closer to seventy percent because with five or more, it's at least sixty-seven percent. So it's and very high. What if and what if it was a primary C-section? Um, with a previa, um, yes. it's three percent. Okay, so let's say she doesn't have a previa. Six C section. What's her risk of accreta? No previa. Um, I, I want to say it's somewhere in the five to ten percent. And what about primary C section with a previa? It's it's decimals. It's less than one percent. Okay, continue. Um, so she presented for her first um, OB appointment with me. Um. I got a history and physical. Um, I just had a ultrasound from just a kind of our ultrasound text downstairs. Um, and I wanted to verify that this wasn't an accreta. So I actually got her on with the MFM the same day. Um, he wasn't um, impressed, didn't think it was an accreta, but um, given that she was so far in her pregnancy, I was uh, I counseled her about all of the risks with a repeat C-section. So let me ask you this. Was there any consideration in doing an MRI? Um, I don't. Let me ask you, where was, where was the location of the, of the placenta? It was posterior. It was posterior, okay. 
continue. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, in a typical patient, if I had seen her earlier, I would consider an MRI uh, more for surgical but what's diagnosis. In, but what's the difference between early and later? Um, it, earlier, I think I could potentially... Well, I, I think there's more time. The The concern with her is she was so late um, and passed the typical recommendation for when you would deliver somebody with a previa um, that I, I, knowing that she had that increased risk, I was um, more along the lines of just proceeding with delivery. So let me ask you, do you work in a level three hospital? Um, what some of our hospitals, I work in multiple hospitals. Um, one of them is a level three. Is this where you did this patient? Yes. But you didn't want to get an MRI ahead of time? No. Okay, continue. Um, so <clears throat> this patient had a few social things. Um, where I practice, I actually have a very high Amish population. Um, and she just meeting her for the first time, she wasn't considering delivery the same day. So I actually got her set up um, the following week. During the week when I knew that I'd have extra hands, um, I had everybody notified, had the blood bank um, prepared as well. Um, and I had also counseled her about the very high likelihood for a hysterectomy. Um, she didn't want that. She wanted to continue having more pregnancies. However, she um, was pretty reasonable knowing her risks. So um, I also had one of my partners available on standby um, in preparation. And um, the last thing they did was also give her TXA preoperatively. Um, we started the C-section, um, was very honestly uncomplicated. The placenta came out very easily. However, we got into um, some atony and then that's where kind of everything happened after that. Um, she, so she wasn't an accreta? She wasn't an accreta. <laughs> she was yeah. not. She was not. Um, just a and the, atonic. And the, history, and, and, and the um, pathology of the uterus confirmed that? Yes. Okay, continue. So um, she had an atonic uterus. Um, I proceeded to give her uterotonic agents. She did get um, methogen, hemabate, pitocin. We had also tried uh, a B-Lynch suture at one point. However, that didn't work. And then um, kind of the last effort was to try and place a Bakri balloon, but her cervix wasn't dilated enough. Um, so we aborted that and then that's what What do you mean, what do you mean that the cervix wasn't dilated enough? <clears throat> I, uh, during this portion, I remained up top um, doing kind of a bimanual massage while one of my partners went below to try and place the Bakri balloon. Could you um, put the Bakri from just, the top and put it out through the bottom? He actually went from below. He tried to place it through the cervix. You couldn't put it from the, could, you, could you put it through the top and put it out through the cervix? I could have. Um, I think it would have been a little more difficult. Um, I, I, I'm trying to think. Actually, at this at this point, the hysterotomy was already closed. So okay. that that actually was why we had tried to go from okay. below. How much did she lose? Her cubia was twelve fifty. Oh, that's not bad. So what no, are ultrasound findings? Uh huh. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to mention that I gave her a unit of packed red blood cells in the OR as well. Okay. What are ultrasound findings suggestive of an abnormal placentation? Um, you can see placental lakes, um, blurred margins, um, kind of behind the placenta and near the, the myometrium. Um, I'm going to start with that. And why, does, uh, and why does an accreta develop specifically? Um, so an accreta is just uh, abnormal growth of the placenta kind of deeper into the, the uterus. And it could be there from a prior scar from, from any kind of surgery, not necessarily a C-section. It could exactly. be from Exactly. <laughs> What's the pathology? <clears throat> I know oh, it invades, um, but invades what? 
Um, is it, does it have something to do with the trophoblasts? I, I will be honest, I might have to look that up. Okay. Now tell me the different, uh, the accreta spectrum, the different levels. Um, so that would include the accreta, uh, in creta and per creta. Um, a creta is just just into the uterus, um, and in creta is into the myometrium, and per creta is kind of past that serosa into other organs. Now, the ABCAR went from nine to seven. Is that correct? Yes. How th what happened there? I think the baby just, I, 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 I want to say it probably had something to do with like a secondary apneic event, but I'm not quite sure. Okay. And the patient only stayed one day in the hospital after all this is because she's Amish yes. and didn't want to spend the money? Because I know they're yes, all self-pay, correct? That's what I'm, that was one of the points I was kind of dreading. So um, I did follow early hemoglobins and she went from 12.9 to 10.9. Um, I she didn't lose that much on, and you gave her a unit. So that's not bad. I know. I honestly, yeah. I think 1250 was probably a little bit, uh, I don't think it was that high, but, um, but I did, I did um, round on the patient multiple times, um, making sure when she was stable, um, she had a very strong desire to leave that day. A lot of it was monetary um, and kind of a social background. I think there's a genuine distrust of the hospitals. Um, no, with the I mean, but you felt she was, because the other option was to have her sign out AMA, but you felt she was stable enough to go home? Borderline. <laughs> I mean, her vitals always remained normal. She had a stable, appropriate hemoglobin. Um, I talked to her about uh, discharging, you know, as late as possible um, and having early follow-up um, within a couple of days, um, and she was agreeable to that. Um, was it was I 100% comfortable? I wouldn't say this on the exam. No, but yeah. But the thing is, if you weren't 100% comfortable, then she should have signed out AMA. Okay. Right. Yes. I'm not saying you, you should lie in the exam. You should be very honest. But and we've done that all. I'm sure everybody on the call. There's the patient. You're like, mm, I'm not sure. But you're like, you gave it to her. But maybe you shouldn't have. But nothing bad happened to her, so it was the right thing, right? Mm -hmm. But now you're here saying, how do I defend it? Yeah. So, you, but you could say the patient was very stable. She was our, she was meeting all her milestones. Her, her hemoglobin was stable. She was passing gas. She was tolerating PO. She was ambulating without any difficulty, any symptoms of anemia. And she strongly desired to go home because she was self-pay. She, okay. she was more than accommodating to stay if, she did not meet those milestones, but and and I had follow up with her two days later at, at the at the clinic or whatever, whatever you did, you know. Okay. Does Great. that help any or not really? <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's. <laughs> yeah, I, I I think that's one of the things I was worried about because I mean she was very stable, like she knew what to do after a C-section and she was actually meeting all of her milestones. It was more just okay. so on that's paper, that's I think that was my hesitation. Right, right. Okay. And just saying, well, you met your milestones, you met your milestones, you know? Okay. And they could ask you a lot of questions about the uterotonics. Mm -hmm. But okay. I wanted to focus more on the accreta. Okay? Great. For everybody on the call. Other questions? Good job. Thanks. Okay, so let me go over it. So accreta is anchoring placental villi attached to the myometrium rather than decidua. In creta, anchoring placental villi penetrates to the myometrium. Per creta, anchoring placental villi penetrate through the myometrium to the uterine serosa or adjacent organs. You were correct with your percentages. So a previa, if you have a previa, primary C-section, 3% of the time you can have an accreta. By the fifth C-section, it's the 67% chance of accreta. In the absence of a previa, primary C-section is 0.03% accreta. Six C-section is 4.7%. Findings suggestive of abnormal placentation, multiple irregular placental lacunae, disruption of bladder line, loss of clear zone, myometrial thinning, abnormal vascularity, placental budge, exophytic, 
mass. Why does an accreta develop? Specifically, the trophoblastic tissue invades beyond nitabuck layer, N-I-T-A-B-U-C-H. Okay. okay. Good with that, Michelle? I am, thank you. All right, very good, good job. All right, I'm just gonna check here if anybody has any questions here. Okay, so I see nobody else adding any questions. Um, I know we're past time, but I got no problem doing one more. Anybody else want to be part of the hot seat? Amelia, I'm going in your direction. It says you're self-muted. Still says you're self-muted, Amelia. And you're on here twice. So am I picking the right one? Are you there, Amelia? I am. Ah, I'm picking the wrong one. You're on here twice. Don't know why. Yeah, I was on my phone <laughs> in my oh, computer. Oh, sweet. Okay. Okay, gotcha. Was there a specific case you want to go over? Um, no, any of them. Any of them in what section? Are you a subspecialist or a generalist? I'm a generalist. Okay. Let's see. So I'm trying to think. What have we done today? We've done a bunch of OB. Hold on. It's taking a while, though. Flip it over. You want office or GYN? You tell me. Uh, we can do office. <laughs> office? Office it is. Let's take a look. I'm just looking. Are you there, Amelia? Yes. I don't know. I had some connections issues. Bear with me a second. Me too. <laughs> Good. So I don't know if it was my end, your end. I have no idea. Hopefully everybody else is on the call. So you can hear me, right? Yes. Okay, sweetness. All right. 
so bear with me, I lost my place. Can you see my screen? Yes. Awesome. I hope everybody else is on the call. If not, we're still here. Okay, so case number 26. So you have a patient who had unprotected sexual intercourse. I'm okay. going to change the story a little bit. Let's say she was sexually assaulted. Okay. Okay, so what does the CDC recommend for empiric treatment or should be addressed after a sexual assault? Um, so there should be treatment for the common STDs, gonorrhea, chlamydia, trichomonas. Um, so tell me how you do that. Go through all that. What okay. treatment, dosing? They, they would get a dose of a cephalosporin. Um, and azithromycin oral. So how much how much cephalosporin and what's that treating? The 250 milligrams of cephalo of rovirocephin is treating the gonorrhea and the azithromycin. Where did that change? Um, azithromycin for the chlamydia. How much? 1,000 milligrams oral. Okay, continue. Um, and then the flagell, 500 milligrams, twice a day for seven days for the trichomonas. Now, would you want to give somebody a seven day course or something after they've been sexually assaulted? No, that was a recent change for the trichomonas mm -hmm. before it was 2000 milligrams oral times one mm -hmm. dose. Okay. And when, when and continue? Um, we would also um, discuss with them about prep therapy for HIV prophylaxis. How would you do that? Um, I honestly, I don't know the regimen for that. I would have to look it up. Okay, continue. Um, That is all I would do as far as treatment. Sure. There's more stuff you can do. You're overlooking something. Um, I would also give them a course of the doxycycline. For something else. Mm. You're thinking STDs. What are you missing? Um, syphilis. No. No STD. Something else. Oh. Okay. I'm, my mind is a blank. Somebody had unprotected sexual intercourse. You're worried about STD and what else? Mm. Oh, and pregnancy. That's so right. So what would you do? Mm. Uh, they could do a plan B. Okay, so what is plan B? What exactly is in plan B? Um, it is, I don't know how to pronounce it. It is erlopristol, I believe. Yeah, I think it's erlopristol. So let me ask you this, what emergency contraception options are available? How many? There is plan B, they can also do um, a copper IUD. Mm -hmm. And what else? Uh, I believe now they can also do the levonorgestrel IUD. Anything else? They can do a taper of OCPs. Anything else? Um, so you're saying plan B 
Is it olipristal? Yes. What if I tell you, no, you're wrong? What if I told you plan B is levonorgestrel? Okay, the early pristal is the one that you can do within a longer mm -hmm. time period. Okay. Yes, what, so what time frame? Five days for the early pristal for the plan B is up to 72 hours. Now, what is the mechanism of action of plan B? Um, it prevents ovulation. And what about the olipristal? I am not sure about that one. I would have to look that up. Anything else you'll address because of her sexual assault? Um, counseling services, mm -hmm. obviously for trauma, PTSD, um, and then discuss um, contraception after treatment. What do you mean by contraception after treatment? Like if she would want like contraception. after this trauma. Why specifically contraception? I'm just asking. Um, so I was like for this particular patient, I, um, she did not want kids at all. And so I, that what happened to her and the scare that she had made her well, I changed the story i made her sec i made it a sexual assault so oh, yeah, i kind of changed did. the story i'm not yeah i'm not bringing this particular patient which they do a lot on the exam okay gotcha um so just be, know exactly what they're asking so to speak okay um i mean i feel like that's what i would normally do is discuss contraception options, but I've never encountered a traumatic um, assault. So, when when would you have to follow her up? When is it recommended that you follow her up? Within three months. Anything else you would do for her? Um, just make sure that she's up to date on like a pap smear, um, HPV vaccine and stuff. Okay. All right. Let's stop there. What'd you think? Yeah, I need to brush up on some things. No, you did. I think you did overall pretty good. I had to push you a little bit. Don't forget that emergency contraception. Yes. Okay. So this is according to the CDC. Okay, after a sexual assault, mental health counseling, ceftriaxone for gonorrhea is now 500 milligrams okay. or one gram if you're greater than, I believe, than 250 pounds. I'd have to look that up. Okay, I believe it's 250 pounds, but it's 500 milligrams IM. Your azithromycin for your chlamydia, one gram PO times one. You're correct, it is doxycycline, 100 milligrams. BID times seven days, but do you want to give that regimen to that patient? Mm -hmm. You know, same thing with the flagell. The recommended is 500 milligrams BID for seven days. However, she was assaulted, so maybe it'd be better just to give her the flagell two grams PO times one for the trick. Okay. Okay. Patients with decline in empiric treatment should be seen in one week after initial evaluation to determine need for treatment based on initial testing and repeat testing if needed. Hep B, if previously vaccinated, unknown to be immune, give booster. If uncertain, if vaccine received, then treat with full vaccine and give Hep B immune globulin. HIV, antiretrovirals are best begun within four hours and not prescribed if greater than 72 hours has passed. Even though presumed low risk of transmission and lack of evidence providing efficacy, it should be offered. HPV vaccine recommended if unvaccinated, your emergency contraception. 
Your plan B is levonorgestrel, 0 0.75 milligrams Q12 hours for two doses or 1.50 milligrams PO times one, 72 hours or off-label 120 hours or five days. It delays or inhibits ovulation. Olipristol or the ELA is a selective progesterone receptor modulator, 30 milligrams PO times one, 120 hours or five days. It delays or inhibits ovulation. Paragard, five days or 120 hours. So which is the most effective? Amelia? You still with me? Yes. Which is the most effective? I'm sorry? The Paragard. Paragard? Second best effective. Uh, early Pristol. Exactly. And the last but not least is Plan B. So the Paragard has a failure rate of 0.19%. Early Pristol is 1.4%. Plan B is 3%. Okay. 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 Post exposure prophylaxis. Begin one or two hours after exposure and within 72 hours of exposure. The regimen includes a nucleoside slash tide combination plus an integrase inhibitor. I'm gonna really not pronounce these 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 terms or these medications correctly. So oral tenovir, 300 milligrams, and emetrixabine, 200 milligrams daily plus doltegravir, 50 milligrams Q day. This has increased risk of open null tube def defects, the doltegravir. So then you would give the raltagravir, 400 milligrams BID in pregnancy or childbearing women. Used for four weeks, however, optimal duration is unknown. It can be discontinued if source patient is HIV negative, which you may not be able to assess that because she was assaulted, okay? So questions? Nope. All right, good job. Thank you very much. Very good. So um, I'm gonna see if anybody has any questions. So, Anzi says the sexual assault and risk of STI shouldn't be contraindication for IUD insertion. No, because if she has any testing that's positive, you just treat her. If patient obese, IUD would be preferred. What do you mean by that? Because then the emergency contraception may not work as uh, as well. Is that what you're saying? There is no contraindication really to give anybody um, emergency contraception. I'm talking about the the oral medication. No VTE history, nothing. There is no real con. Some people say it may not be as effective in somebody who's more obese, um, but still, they could take it. But realistically, you could give it to anybody. Would the Miranda be second best for emergency contraception since failure rate is 0.3%? Um, I mean, the best one's the Paragard. So I guess that would be it. Um, I'd have to double check how good the numbers are with the Mirena. I don't know if the package insert says it could be used for emergency contraception. I have to double check that because usually you go to that package insert and, you know, if something is able to be done with their product, they're going to promote it. Okay. So lower efficacy. Well, correct, Anzi. The best one is the uh, Paragard followed by a lapristal, and then followed by the plan B. So the best failure rate is always the Paragard, okay, in comparison to the plan B. Still, they're all good, but the best one's the Paragard, okay? Do we as physicians have the obligation to encourage police reporting of the assault? I mean, that's something you should offer the patient. Um, I mean, of course, there's the sane nurse and you do that at the hospital and all that stuff. And they take the pictures and all that stuff. So definitely if if um, the patient wants to report something and she hasn't showered and stuff like that, I mean, she could go get a rape kit. And if you're not, um, 
you know, certified in doing that, you can, you know, escort the patient to the appropriate place so it could be done appropriately for her. So I have somebody writing here, one of the MOC articles, levonorgestrel versus copper IUD devices for emergency contraception in the New England Journal of Medicine, I guess, non-inferiority random controlled trial. Okay. Not sure if it's enough to change practice yet. Well, I would have to check on the, on the, because that's a right now, when you look at up to date, this is what it says. It could change. Well, the Marina is now good for eight years. And it was good for seven years last year. And the practice insert, or excuse me, the uh, product insert is updated now to eight years. So they'll be quick on it if it works. Was non, it says the levonorgestrel IUD was non inferior to the copper IUD for emergency contraception, 0.3% compared to 0%. So again, I haven't seen that the up to date has changed that it's the, the Mirena is number four on the list, so to speak, for emergency contraception. Okay, so thank you for that information, Erica. Alrighty, so I know we're past time, so at this point I want to make sure everybody's had all their questions answered. Is there any question that was not addressed that needs to be addressed? Because there was a bunch of questions, it just boomed. So I'm going to lower everybody's hands. Does anybody have any questions that they want to ask a specific question? You want to raise your hand? I don't see. Did everybody get their questions answered? I hope everybody has. I'm just here giving a couple of minutes. I don't see anybody raising their hand. Okay, if anybody has any other questions, can you put them in the box before I let everybody? off the call. So hopefully everybody found this beneficial, perhaps not. Um, any recommendations how to improve? Put it in the box here. Uh, when I end the call, I'll stay on for a couple of minutes to see if anybody has any other recommendations to make it beneficial for the person that's on the hot scene and plus those that are listening so they can learn something about different topics. Um, any questions, please put them in here. If asked how long the Morena approved, what's the answer? Eight years, Hadi. eight years. That is from the medication insert, eight years. It used to be seven years. It's updated. I checked it just last week. It is eight years. Okay. Um, I appreciate the kind words, Alyssa. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Michelle, for your kind words. Um, any other questions? I just want to make sure all questions were answered. I hope we went through a lot of topics. FDA approved for eight years. Yes, Rita. Yes. And the package insert supports that. Emergency contraception, not to my knowledge as of yet. Okay. I know there's been lots of studies and all that. Don't bring the studies into it. Um, because then they may want you to say what studies. Um, but uh, yes, to my understanding, there's been a lot of studies, but it has not yet been approved for that indication for the emergency contraception, the Mirena. Um, and you know, I'm sure that the, the uh, manufacturer is pushing for it, you know, because that's more business for them. Unfortunately, you know, with a sexual assault, but more business for them. You know how that is. It's all about the Benjamins um, for all the companies that make all these nice products for us. Um, any other questions? Should we be talking off-label use of things? Kendra, you can bring that up, just like letrozole is not FDA approved for ovulation induction. You must let the patient know that. So as long as you advise the patient that it's off-label use and the patient's okay with that, you can proceed with that. I don't see anything wrong with that, okay? As long as you know that it's off-label and you have that, that informed decision-making process shared decision making with the patient. Okay, Kendra? So there's nothing wrong with that. It goes back to the letrozole. Letrozole is not FDA, to my understanding, as of yet, as of today, is not FDA approved for ovulation induction. However, it is recommended for individuals who have PCOS with a BMI of greater than 30 because there's a greater live birth rate in those type of patients. Okay? So I want to thank Tiffany, Alexandra, 
Gabrielle, Laurel, Michelle, and Amelia for participating in the hot seat. Great job. Um, I think everybody. Next plan on how long is now approved. Rita, I think it's still three years. I would have to double check that. I have not checked that that uh, medication insert in some time, but to my understanding, it's still three years. I'd have to double check that. Okay, Rita. So don't quote me on that. I haven't checked that practice in, in, in that medication insert in about two years. But the last check was three years. Just double check that. I don't think that's been changed. I do not think, but I could be wrong. Okay. Um, any other questions before I let people off the call? Well, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for everybody's attention. I am going to stay on for a couple of minutes. If anybody has any suggestions on how to improve our webinars, because we're always here trying to, to, to improve. So you guys can learn, learn as quickly as possible, because I know we're, we're running out of time. We have less than uh, three weeks for or four weeks for some of the people who are taking it in October. Um, but I wish uh, everybody continued good studies, a good uh, night and a good rest of the week. Thank you so much. Good night.